Hi, welcome to the ADK Rock uh, Metal channel. It's Kirk hosting tonight's interview. I am delighted to welcome one half of the English hardcore duo Death Goals. And today with me is vocalist and guitarist Harry Bailey. How are you doing, Harry? I'm all right, babes. How are you? Yeah, as I was saying just off camera, I, I'm not, you look absolutely knackered. Just quickly tell us that's got to be because of this extensive Great British tour that you've done in May. You went from Glasgow, Liverpool, Birmingham. Yeah, right. we did a bit of touring. It's our first sort of tour back, our first show is since uh, playing with Heck in December. So, a little bit knackering, but I mean, I, I just work hard and I, I was stressing as I booked all of the tour and I was more logistics and stuff than I thought. So, I just haven't stopped for since January 1st. So, today was my first day of not having anything to do so I've, I've been chilling I've been sleeping so I, yeah I'm not looking quite as a rejuvenating and glam but I have done a face mask so I thought that might do something you've prepared for the interview then yeah of course <laughs> I'll go um, look glam you released you released your sophomore album The Garden of Dead Flowers on Prosthetic mm. Records so it's a follow-up to 2021 The Horrible and the Miserable um, so you just said that you've done all the booking and had to do a lot of the admin and promotional side of things. Where, where does Prosthetic Records come into this? Because they are one of the most prestigious labels. In so, so we haven't done all the stuff. So I've done, for the tour we just did, I did a lot of the booking. We have got a booking agent. Um, but for that tour, I did a lot of the booking. Prosthetic have done loads of work from the promo of, sort of shipping it out. They're the reason we could do vinyl. They're the reason we had budget to record like we did to do some of the videos like we had, like they've, they've been really lovely to us. We're very um, intensive as a band. We're very, we like to know the details and we like to sort of be very heavily involved. So in the sort of the pre up to it being released, we have a lot of uh, emails and texts and uh, things being sent forward and there still are, we're in contact with them near enough weekly with them. Um, yeah, it's been really cool to sort of work with a, a label like Prosthetic. It's not something we ever thought would be available to us. Um, and they came to us, which is even sillier. Like, we weren't really ship, like, looking around for labels or anything post Horrible and Invisible. And they sort of messaged us a couple of weeks after that first album being released, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, they're lovely. They've got a really lovely team, Steve and Becky and Will, and obviously EJ who runs it. Like, they're lovely. Like, yeah, prosthetic have been nothing but delicious for us. They've been wonderful. Definitely gives you that prestige, doesn't it? Because I mean, I'm the editor of Screen Blast Repeat, and I I'm on their mailing list. I, I I review every album that comes out on that label. It's a good mix of black metal, tech death, hardcore. Um, your good friends in People Slicer, Blossom, came out last Friday. I fucking love that record. It's an amazing album. Like, that's the thing, you, you, you stay prestige. Like, obviously, I knew it through, like, Gojira and, like, yeah. I'm a God and all these sort of ones, and obviously through Slicer. But, like, they have such a really, like, their roster is amazing. For, like, like, well, Creek, who've just been added, who are mates of ours as well, who are amazing. Like, Creek, Dawn Raid, like, People yeah, Slicer, that's... like, oh um, God. Oh fuck, there was someone else who was That's that Swiss. Telegram, thing. like, they they are very good at getting bands who aren't just a black metal band, or they're not just a hardcore band. They're, they, they're very good at signing bands with something to say, or a very unique way of looking at the sort of genre or sound they're doing. Which is why it's quite nice to be on that. We didn't feel like we were just like, oh, we're a hardcore band or whatever. Like, they, they have an interest in us for a reason. Not just because we're a hardcore band or whatever. Yeah, I, I know you more. Am I right in thinking... Well, I know you from your previous band, Chind. And mm. Andy Edwards, who's also part of this channel, he apologises he couldn't come here. You'll see him wearing the chin long sleeve oh, yeah. quite often on some of our videos. Did, weren't you really, didn't you really spring out more of the power violence scene? You know, especially with the likes of Trading Hands and bands in Hertfordshire. So, me and Grog both come from like the emo, like alt rock scene way more. Um, I we both played in like twinkly emo, like math rock bands. Um, 
and then we sort of became better friends and chinned and that was our first sort of proper foray into like real extreme power violence and stuff and I love that stuff like that's music I love listening to and seeing before that's just not stuff I've ever played before so with Grog doing that sort of vocal um so yeah we sort of got to know each other through chinge and all that sort of stuff um but Harvard has such a weird and eclectic music scene of like there's loads of like PV bands there's loads of noise bands there's loads of post-punk and indie and like it's got everything it's a, it's a really cool scene currently and like because we feed into London as well like you just get a nice little circular rotation of like just cool bands and stuff. Are you originally from Hitchin? Are you from Hertfordshire originally? Yeah, yeah. Well, me and Grog live on the same road in Hitchin. Right. Oh, okay. Gro- when you say Grog, are you talking about George Milner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. George Grog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what surprised me is when I saw Chin, he was on vocals and you were on drums. Mm. And in this band, I, com- I can't believe how good Grog is. Fantastic on drums. He's as good as you. Well, Grog's a way better drummer than me. Drums is his first instrument. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like, go back and do something like history. Like, Grog was the drummer of a band, a band called Pet Library, who were like emo twinkly and stuff. And he did that for fucking ages. And he was in loads of like metalcore bands and stuff beforehand. So Chin was the first time he'd ever just done vocals by himself. I had always played guitar and sang in like, post hardcore, like, alt rock bands or whatever so me playing and i played drums on the side a little bit um but chin was the first time i was like seriously playing drums so like it was a big like comfort zone pushing band for us chin um aaron will love that he should get in with this much fucking airtime he fucking speaking of aaron right the front cover to your new album is that mm. either aaron or max Hummerstone from the band that's Stephen? maxi that's maxi oh, from Reading hands how cool is that? Yeah, because when I when I saw the cover, it's like I know that guy. He used to work in Red Lion, and he's a well, they they say uh, them pronouns. Oh, okay, um, really? Yeah, yeah, do indeed. Um, yeah, they're a gorgeous human being. Um, funnily enough, the video or well, that the cover shoot was done before they started identifying and using they them pronouns. But I knew I wanted Max to be in that sh- like cover. I. I, I, so I thought up the covers for this and Horrible and Miserable, they both just came to me in like dreams, which is concerning. Um, but I knew I wanted someone of Maxi's like visual look and I wanted the pair that originally I wanted to try and find like a big prom dress, like a big like chiffon, beautiful, like almost swallowing them up, this material. Um, then I ended up borrowing my partner's dress, which I'd worn at TV shows. I thought that ties in with like the theme of a garden of good flowers and it's yellow. I was thinking like the animals like a very yellow. I don't know why we thought that the animals yellow, but the animals very yellow in our brains of like colour scheme wise. And we wanted to have a bit of a yellow scheme for this, so Maxie's gorgeous. I love them very much. They're a very sweet, wonderful human being. And also it sort of speaks true to this, like the idea of the whole album being this a far more queer focused album to have a queer person on the front cover to have someone who much like me and George do not maybe to the outside visually seem or read as queer as blatantly as some might but we are still that and it's you know it's a very queer visual but very gnarly hardcore visual as well yeah can I can I let, let's go into that before we talk about the album mm. so, First thing, can I just come back to, um, let, let's just say, the person on the front cover? You know when they say, identify as they or them? Hmm. What does that mean? Does that mean that they're gender neutral? It someone... means they identify as neither male or female. Right, okay. They yeah. occupy a space between or neither. It's Gender identity is a very large and very, it's not confusing, it's quite simple, but it's quite a large spectrum as all things gender are um if you believe in such things as we very much do in this band and this, this community um so yeah max uses they them i use he they grog uses he they to my knowledge um it is a constant changing spectrum tomorrow could be a different day and i think actually no that doesn't relate to me anymore but i've never found comfort in 
the he, him, Mr. Whenever like parents are like, I work in a restaurant. Parents have been like, oh, say nice, thank you to the nice man to their kids. Where I've been like, I don't like that. Like it doesn't feel right. Everyone's called me sir. It doesn't feel right. Um, it's a comfort thing. It's a dysphoric thing. It's it's complicated. But yeah, Max Max uses they them. That leads into track number one on the album. So just let me give the viewers and listeners some context. This album, Death Goes, A Garden of Dead Flowers, came out on the 5th of May. Am I right in thinking? Or have I got that? Very much that. We've just yeah. celebrated the first month. 5th of May, yep, prosthetic record. So it's important mm-hmm. people know that. And can they get it on vinyl? You said that it's at the pressing plant, or is it available now on vinyl? It's pressed on vinyl. So we have, I think we've only got three copies left on the store, which is quite cool. Um, there's loads of room CDs and stuff. I think we might be doing another like variation at some point after these go. Um, we've got some in physical that we're selling at shows. Yeah, the vinyl, vinyl's called cool. bright yellow. It's disgusting. I'll be I'll be getting the CD. I'm quite Hell old. yeah! Really, I'm pleased that you're still pressing CDs. Dude, it was all prosthetic. I did not. I I. You want a curtain? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'll I'll pull the curtain. Why I didn't want these CDs? Only because I've got like in my. I, I still live with my parents. In one of my old room, I've still got a box of CDs from like one of my old, old bands. I was like, we, we printed like 50 of these and I still have like 27 CDs. They never, people don't want them, but we still have a few on tour, but like people enjoy vinyl more. I think vinyl's far more of an experience and a, there's more variation. There's more stuff you can sort of add and change to a vinyl, whereas the CD is sort of there, but the CD you can play in your car. You can't play that in a vinyl, so yeah, true. each their own. Yep, definitely CD for me. So let's talk about track number one then. Gender is clones of game show hosts. Mm. Like the, uh, almost alliteration there. So I'm, I'm just going to give you an analysis of what I thought when I first heard this song. So I like the hysterical screen vocals that you're performing at the beginning. Thank you. Impact French guitars. I really like that. There's a lot of bleed in your guitar and mm. deliberate, like hardcore. It's really rough, isn't it? Mm. And they bubble along and then, and then a common beat comes in and I'm just waiting for this really ugly dissonant like dyad type riff and it does come in mm. i'm not saying it's predictable i love that so when i was first listening to this album i was on a countryside walk and it just got me in the first minute i was like "Fuck yes i'm gonna enjoy this um and again i do you know what i like about your vocals as well the english you can oh yeah very is that, that's great you're not trying to be someone you're not and i i, I think i think we should have more regional accents um in- i love a regional accent like any band, like Ollie from Breathing the Horizon, that Sheffield accent's wicked. Yeah. Like the guys in um, ah, oh, what fucking Scottish band? Is it? Oh, the Proclaimers. Oh well, yeah, the Proclaimers. Let's say the Proclaimers. That's that's way funnier. Like sick. Like a good regional accent's banging. And like Grog has a very very, what I like to call like the hard man voice. Like his hard man, like hardcore voice. I really like mine's just very shrieky, but it is still very British. I don't think we'll be throwing on any like four one heights like uh, Ohio Midwest screamo vocal like accents anytime soon. It's still really aggressive though. Can I ask you mm. a question? How do you manage to keep your voice because you are deliberately going against any form of vocal training? And I, know I don't. That- My voice is fucked all the time. Well, that's what's great about hardcore, isn't it? Singers deliberately great shred their voice. That's I mean, it, it, if you can work out a way of longevity, do. I know there's some, like, um, Drewell's vocalist, they were talking about recently, like, they were, like, a week into a tour with I Told You I Would Eat You. No, I told you, you the world is a beautiful place, I'm no longer afraid to die, whatever it is. Like, my voice is fucked. My voice is completely gone. I'm still going to do the shows regardless. Like, this May tour, I was in, I was ill because from like I just stressed myself out too much. My voice was fucked. I could, performed. I worked out a way of doing some vocals, but for the first like three shows, I was furious because I couldn't perform like I wanted to. I have a way. The last tour we did and all of last year's touring, I had a regime where I know if I'm, I drink this throughout the day and I have these little warm-ups and stuff, I can do that stuff fine. Like, it, is, it really is about having, you can shriek and do whatever you want as long as you're actually taking some precautions and some care for your voice. 
Because if I didn't, that I, I I would be ruined. And I've learned. I've been doing death metal for like seven odd years. Like I've learned through seven odd years of what not to do and what works for my voice. Um, but then I see some people like the Vicarage, who we were just on tour with. Ben has an unbelievable understanding of how his voice works. So he's got the full technique down. He can do all the fry screams, the high, like the death core stuff, the low, like death metal stuff. I can't do any of that. I have one sound I can do. But I do that sound well, I think. And as a unit, it works. I've learned how to not be completely like hoarse after a show. So yeah, it's, it's rough. Like recording was very much a, we're taking breaks. We're looking after ourselves. We're not pushing it to a point where I'm ruining myself because longevity is key. I want to be able to do this for as long as possible. Not, I can do two shows and then I'm fucked. Especially it being a two piece, we can't really get away with having one of us down. Definitely, like you say, that would you won't be able to play, would you? What are you? Can I just ask about the lyrics on the song? I found this <laughs> fascinating, and I was thinking, is this a protagonist or is it personal? I definitely thought it was about transgender dysphoria. I'm just going to read you the lyrics. One thing I am certain: I'm not certain who I am. A creature of discomfort, barely a man. The skin I inhabit is not who I am inside. Is, are you, is that a, a protagonist, like a, a fictitious person that props up throughout this album, or is that more personal? No, it's not a concept album. We've left that to Slicer. That's Slicer's world. Um, that It's me, it's George, it's any queer people who I do not feel at home in their own body. Like... We did. We were very much. I I decorated my skin with tattoos and stuff to feel more human. I got a chest tattoo so I felt more comfortable having my shirt off at shows because I hated revealing any part of my sort of skin or anything at shows because I'm quite hairy, uh, like dark, masculine creature, and that isn't how I want to look at all at the best of times. Um, but the tattoo made me feel better um, about that, more comfortable because I was owning the skin I have. And this whole album was very dysphoric. A lot of writing about from that sort of place. We, we, it was a far more deliberately queer, sort of coded album in terms of lyrics. Um, we wanted that to be the case. We went into it being like, we've alluded to these themes on the first album, but this is the album where we're going to really hammer them home. Yeah, I, I first heard this theme in the song from your last album, Shrike. I think mm. it certainly came through in that, didn't it? This is a really almost agonizing moment in that song from that 2021 album. Mm. And yeah, it's definitely more apparent here, isn't it? So if yeah. we move on to track number two, the title track, The Garden of Dead Flowers, I, I, this is like the closest you come to almost like raw mid-range hardcore punk, I think. But there's a lot of dissonance in the guitar mm. chords that you're playing. and the other thing I've noticed here is you've got quite an impressive layering of guitar distortion. So even though you're a duo, am I right in thinking there are there are overdubs in this song? Or have I yeah, been... yeah, yeah. On the on the on the album, there's like another guitar. There's maybe two. There's a bass, a left and right, and then like maybe a center one for like the guitar at the very end of this song. Um, like we've never shied away from that and being able to add layers and stuff like. That's what the studio is for, but we then enjoy recontextualizing the songs for a live situation, um, which I, I'll get onto further with like Death Girls and Cursive. Like that song sounds completely different live to how it does on the record, but we really enjoy that and it keeps it very fresh for us and very um, just exciting. Like being able to be like, cool, we can't, I haven't got a loop pedal, I'm not good enough of a loop pedal to keep these bits going, so fuck it. We just won't play that section well i'll add something different or i think that's been an integral part of a deaf girl set for quite some time with me improvising and changing the songs sort of on the fly like it's an element i remember seeing the fall of troy talk about being like our songs do sound different from the record to live and that's what's cool it makes me want to come to shows it's, you never know how the show the song's going to end up yeah yeah i think that's you do see that. I don't think it's what it's commonplace what you're saying, but yeah, I, I'm aware of bands who like, hey, buy the record, 
when we approach a gig on live, we might just decide we want to do acoustic. We might want yeah. to extend the songs that are two minutes to ten minutes. We'll do what the fuck we want. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you're right. What you said as well. You only get one chance to record an album. So why wouldn't you put everything you add can? Add loads of stuff. Add some hand claps. Add like layering. Like that's half the fun of the studio is being able to do all that sort of stuff. And for like a song like this where we'd written this big expansive outro, we're like, well, this sounds really cool if we add like this like alarm bell, very like uh, uh, Great Britain gallows esque outro sort of thing. Like, cool, let's just go like epic with it. Let's like make it this epic little moment instead of being like, well, we'll half us it and see like how it sounds. Yeah, exactly. Just one thing I meant, I, um, I'm pleased that you said that you, your background is more of the emo alternative rock. Mm. When I reviewed this in my notes, I, at the Garden of Dead Flowers, I wrote down, who remembers when alternative rock sounded as dangerous as this? Oh, so yeah. You told me about your background, so that was accurate. There um, we go. Number three, best song on the album for me, Ultraviolence. Oh, oh yeah. Fuck. This is Dillinger Escape Plan territory, isn't it? How are, you, how are you singing and playing? This 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 surely is impossible. You break you No, that song's well easy. It's it's six four. That, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a really easy. Like it's not hard. There's harder songs to play and sing. Like on, even on this album, there are songs were like uh. I'll, I wouldn't be caught dead t- taking a bullet for you. That's kind dead, of. Wouldn't be dead. caught dead taking a bullet for you. That verse. Yeah, that verse riff while singing is a fucking nightmare. Yeah. Um, and it's something I'm currently practicing in my room, so no, we can't possibly play that song. Because currently, I, I I physically cannot do it. It'll take some mental gymnastics, but yeah. I'll get there. F's, once again, I'll always bring up Slicer. If Kate can play what she plays whilst singing, I can play our stuff, because our stuff is nowhere near as hard as Slicer. Yeah, no, but I, I'm impressed by it. What, what I'm really glad you like this song though. This was a song that I thought was going to be really like, I thought it was very simplistic and very like, interesting to say Dillinger because I always thought it was far more like um, every time I die sort of esque in form. But it's interesting you get a Dillinger from it. Um, we've been playing this song for a while. Like, there's a Die Tan video um, where we played with Steve Space Cowboy where we first played this live and like, I make an attempt of singing the chorus instead of Grog and I completely butcher it, like it's a fucking nightmare. But like, this is one of the older songs on the record, I think. Like, I, I really like this song, I think this song's really cool. The chorus was really fun to write and have Grog take this big like vocal moment instead of that being usually like my part to do. Um And yeah, the breakdown is like pure Norma Jean, like yeah, watch exactly. it. Yeah, I I I I mentioned Norma Jean, I think, when I reviewed it for Screen Burst Repeat. Can you just before we move on to the next song? I'm always interested in the guitar work. Uh, mm. Some of those chords are really strange. You're know, playing; they're deliberately using notes that create these dissonant intervals, aren't mm. they? What do you, is there much theory behind that, or do you just think what what should you not do on a guitar? I'm going to try and do it. I mean, I I've got well, I've I've got a degree in music um, and like performance, and I've studied music since like GCSE, and I did college and uni and all that stuff. So I understand the basics of it. I know what a like minor second like Discord is and all that stuff. I'm not thinking about songs or writing them in, in that theoretical with that like hat on. Um, it's very m- much uh, piecing things together. Like I had the chorus chords, I thought those sound cool. Then I I, I wrote that the main riff of it as a piss take, being like this is just like a fucking thuggish, like no thought riff. Boneheaded, like. Bonehead, yeah, meathead riff. And I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. Let's make that work. And then like the, the like, no, you don't know, like the slides, it's just, it's just jumping up the neck. Like it's very daughters it's very like MySpace, like all that sort of like uh, false grind, white belt stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. Looking at guitars in a way and playing them how they shouldn't be played because I'm not the most like shred-tastic guitar player but I'm good at piecing together silly chords and silly notes and going, yeah, fun. If I can make a grind section go into like a big pop chorus, I've done it. Like that's what, that's my main sort of MO. We're going to move on to track number four. Um, the, the, the opening riff reminds me of Killing Joke. 
mid eighties period, you know, before they turned more into a goth band. I really I've never listened to Killing Joke, I can't lie to you. I, I, I really say that they, they probably started the whole dissonant distorted guitar phrasings, you know, that were that really expanded into metal through Voivod and Gorgots and in hardcore through that band Dead Guy. So I, I kind of see them as the first band that really made it part of the sound. Um th- this one's Sorry, got- I've literally just had to pull up I've just had to pull up the track listing so I know <laughs> what you can remember where we're up to. You know? That's <laughs> so funny. Um Loveless. Loveless. Well, on, tell us about Loveless. Tell us what it mean what the meaning of the song if you want to So th- this to- song um this song is about uh abusive and toxic relationships me and grog have through talking with each other have sort of worked out we've both been in uh what we would now definitely call maybe not at the time but what we would now call as abusive or um toxic relationships and this song was very much written the lyrics were written by george about one of these experiences um it's a really heavy song it's a really weird song yeah um but it's, i i think really cool once again i think where i i i've had that drum beat i write a lot the like i i write drums quite a lot like i think in drum parts before i write in, in guitar parts but i had this like post-punk like drum beat where the song was led by it for ages and i thought it was really really cool to have this sort of thing and then have this like guitar once again the guitar part of that is there's no actual notes being played um it's just behind the nut of my like jazz master i'm just hitting the strings with my, my pick um which is fun and then we added like a jesus piece like two-step riff at the end and like a death chord breakdown and like it's a fuck it's a journey of a song but yeah it's, it's about toxic relationships and sort of these that's the sort of affirmation of you i don't need love that sort of i don't need love enough for this like put, keeping yourself in that situation just for the sake of having someone there who says they love you and they clearly don't or they, they don't show that love in a way which is beneficial or nurturing to you were you unaware at the time that they were probably being manipulative as well you just didn't see it at the time you said it took conversations with others for you to realize oh actually this was toxic i didn't know i mean yeah that's the thing i think we at at the time you know it's a it's probably not a great relationship and then we're talking with friends and then going oh actually mate that sounds a was a bit of a rougher one to me um so yeah Uh, relationships are gross and wonderful until they become wonderful we're now both in really nice relationships so we're the real winners. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Just before we move on to the next song, I agree with you. What I was clever about this, I think it's around two minutes, 20 seconds, and it's threatening this breakdown riff, and, and you really just draw it out. It continues at the same tempo, and then that one at the end is, it bludgeons you, doesn't it? It's like, Hell yeah. that is fucking savage, isn't it? Let's be honest. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're breakdown scientists at this, at this rate. We, we love a breakdown, we have lists and the main talk in the van is what's your favourite breakdown from this band? Oh, well, mine's this. Oh, well, mine's this. Oh, but have you heard this one? Like, we listen to breakdowns almost consistently um, and we take them very seriously as a band. <laughs> uh, next song, um, I know what the word pansy means in a pejorative way, but you've got it as an acronym. What does what um oh that's just stylistic i just oh, okay. it to, oh, it might... it, it's pansy yeah right okay i heard a bit more of that like fugazi type hardcore in this There's yeah some, like, high register like you said your background is more like emo anyway isn't it mm. it's what what do you what was this song coming from musically i know we just mentioned fugazi what did you have in mind Wait, uh... well, take the thing. like just like that melodic hardcore sort of yeah fugazi um like title fight sort of thing um i think title fight in fact was the exact floral green era title fight i think was very much the blueprint for it um yeah this song this song is a like was really weird to write because it's so it was very much like a 
it's a, it's a pop song. It is, it's a pop. It's, it's got a very clear chorus, verse, chorus, verse, bridge, outro. Um, it still has like a few like Death Gullsy, like the second verse being just like noisy section and like this big cathartic outro thing. Um, but I'm really proud of this song. This was one of the first songs we like wrote. Um, it, that really came together when we were doing like pre-production for this album. Like I sort of knew what I wanted, but we sort of piece it all together then. And then this was the first one we wrote the lyrics to together. Where we were like, we both have a similar situation or a similar experience that we can write about here. And that was really exciting. Um, yeah, I love this song. Being able to play this song is really, really cool live now. I, I, I really like playing this song. And it sort of pays homage to like the songs on like first album that were a bit more like poppy, emo rock sort of thing. Um, a little bit like Gender Traitor. It's like a slightly, it's a less heavy Gender Traitor, but I, I love Pansy. I think it's a fucking gorgeous song. Yeah, good use of uh, alternating vocal lines between you and mm. George as well. I think I think that's started to become a staple of your sound now, hasn't mm. it? I always look forward yeah. to each song. It's like, oh, is, this is this is George, and it'll go back to you. And it's yeah, I, I think I'm right. Thinking you're probably going to continue to explore. Oh, absolutely. I I love having if you if you have two people capable of doing vocals, you should utilize them. Yeah. I love it, especially when the vocalists sound different. Like it, it sounds so cool. Um, like there's loads of bands I love to do it. And, I think it adds, like, especially in the site in Panzer, we were using it as a narrative thing of having these two different voices through different parts of the letter that was being read, or like, it's just cool. It's just a cool texture thing. Like, I, I love having two vocalists. I've, I always wanted to have two vocalists in Death Girls, but none of the other. Here and did a few bits of vocal here and there, but like, no one was taking up the mantle like Grog. Because Grog writes loads of the lyrics and stuff with me now, like, it's really nice to have their voice sort of in it as much as mine definitely yeah uh we're ready to move on to a song we've already mentioned track number six death goes in cursive when i first heard this i was thinking sludge metal without distorted guitars and you use this is it like a have you slowed down a sample of a church bell or something no there's no samples i've made that sound what is that then sorry so that is once again, behind the nut of my, the bridge of my jazz master. Oh, right, okay. It's that with, what have I got on it? That with my ring modulator on it. For the bung, and I've got like a reverse delay. Um, so that's like the main sound of that. And then there's like an ambience that we like recorded from just the pedals being on in the room. Yeah. Like it just had this weird sinister hum. So that hum at the beginning of the song it's just the ambient hum of the pedals coming through the amp. Right. Um, which is really cool. And then, yeah, that. And then obviously the end is just this big sludgy conjurer like section. But I, I love the song. This song, this song was a classic of two, three weeks before we went to record. It's, it was a completely different song. I think it sounded like a Death Heaven ripoff or something. I basically went, this sounds shit. This is going to make it. Um, I'm going to write something different. And then the week before going to the studio, I handed in this, like a demo of basically this song. Um, George was like, what the actual fuck is wrong with you? You need to stop doing this. <laughs> um, and the lyrics was originally in Gender's Clans Against Your Heist, but we took those out um, and kept them in this. And it's, this song was just fucking gnarly and dysphoric and just nasty. It's a really fucking intense song and I love it. I think it's a really cool moment in the album, especially post Pansy, which is this really uplifting, gorgeous moment of like queer joy to suddenly go back into, oh no, this is, we're a miserable band and we're two miserable queer people who don't feel comfortable at all in ourselves. Um, and live now, we've, it's become this whole section where I just create like a wall of noise with my pedals and then just run into the audience and just start sh- 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 like screeching the lyrics, climbing stuff. Like, it's fucking cool. Like, so, like, if I do say so myself, it's the sort of shit that I love when bands do. Yeah. So, like, recontextualizing a song, going, 
I can't, in a love situation, I do not have the time to set up and specifically get the settings right for this song. How are we going to perform this song? Because we both wanted to perform it. Like, okay, cool. We'll make it this moment. George has a moment of rest from constant blast beats and skank beats and all that stuff. And I can just run. I can just climb stuff and have a moment where the guitar isn't on me. We can have a little bit of a drink, do all this sort of stuff. So yeah, Death Goals and Cursive is a fucking really cool song. I'm really gassed with that. And that was a fun one to record as well. Like that end bit hit so hard recording that. That was so fucking cool. Yeah, it's a good refueling point on the album. You're right, it didn't charge a break as well because the tempo is very, very gnarly to use your word, isn't it? You know, it's aggressive. Mm. And then this, it's it's, it's, the, it's a quite experimental, isn't it? That's what I like. Very. It. it gets you ready for the second half of the record. So if we move on to this, this great song, I Wouldn't Be Caught Dead Taking a Bullet For You. Mm. you know, this one, definitely to me, when I first heard it, I was like, fuck well, yes, this will appeal to me. Oh, yeah. That's my type of music. And yeah. I, I I just this is the one where I was like, yeah, how how was how can you sing and play that at the same time? That's and you've already said that it's so difficult. You're still practicing it now. Like, it's tricky, but it's a similar thing to um, the horrible and the miserable. Like in terms of like it's a pattern. Once I crack the pattern, I'll have it down. Like I had the same issue with horrible and miserable at the beginning. I was like, this is really hard. And now I I can play that song with my eyes closed. So. It's fine. I this once again was a nutty song. This is a lot of George. This song, um, having the chorus being a breakdown. I wrote the like dance break, like yeah, weird. the break beat. I noticed that. It's like an amen break beat almost. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I originally wanted the drums to be more like the sugar we're going down, like drum intro. Um, we yeah, had this like weird like dance break section. And then like a real meathead, like a real meathead breakdown at the end, um, which we were like ad-libbing, like bun them out and like ironed out like vocals over in the studio being like, no, 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 it needs to have this sort of like proper UK beat down like energy. And I'm like, oh yeah, we've got that. That sounds fucking sick now. You know what I'm going to say? Oh, well, baby, no, so bad. <laughs> it's, like, it's hard. That way, I'm I fucking love that. That's one of the standout parts, isn't it? Especially yeah. when you first listened to it on a countryside walk. Because I could just scream. There's no one around. I, I was like, go by it. I was like, fuck it. I'm going to try and scream this. Hell yeah, sick. <laughs> I love that. That bit That bit was all grog. Like, there was a... We sort of do a little bit of a... Who's going to do what vocal part? Who's going to... He's suits doing this part. Um, and when it came to that, they were like, who's going to do this? I was like, it can only be you, mate. It can only be you. So I haven't got the, like bravado for it but grog has got the like let's go he's, he's got hard man voice it, yeah, it, yeah. like that bit is fucking sick that's a breakdown we used to like open the set with before the album came out like we would just start with that song just watch people kick the shit out of each other banging i think when i see you next i will be waiting for that moment where you where grog screams there'll be no survivors and now that i'm 40 years old and i still wear glasses for a gig it's like, I'm going to have to take a step back here. These are going to get smashed nah, up. Nah, you got my grab. You said you could do vocals now. You got my grab. <laughs> well, the good thing is I can just shout, can't I? Because, you know, I, think, well, I don't think it would be anywhere near as good as what, what you guys are doing. But no, but as long as it's in time and it's the right words. Yeah, you have too many people grabbing them like currently who are not in time and not saying the right words. <laughs> yeah, the learn word. the words. Yeah. Learn the words. Learn the timing. At least know the timing. Yeah. <laughs> Track number eight, fascinating song for me. Emo mm. punk with clear black metal influences. I think mm. you're, you're very close to black metal. I know you said you mentioned- Rob loves black metal. I have no interest in black metal, but I think the chords they use are interesting. Mm. Um, I was coming at this from a very like birds in row, um, like screamo, frail body, like uh, black and hardcore sort of roots. Yeah. Um, it's all just like big, major minor inversion chords um but i i love this song this yeah this song's fucking wicked another song we've been playing quite some time i like just work it into the set and i love this i love this song. it's one of my favorite songs from the album i think quite easily um yeah 
Is there a bass guitar in this? I, I seem to have heard a bass in this. There's there's bass on all the songs. Oh, so I'll get my next. Yeah, because I definitely heard it on this one. Leading up to that that breakdown at the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, it's only one minute and 39 seconds, this song that we're talking about. Um, but yeah, again, I, I think you quite experimental, even though it's such a short song. It's such a strange song every time. How I, so? I, I just, it probably is just that you've got the that emo vibe, but yeah, it is that um, unmelodious black metal texture. Mm. You know, where it's almost doesn't, it doesn't even feel like you listening to guitar, it just feels like you're listening to some kind of humming machine. Does that make sense? But then you've got. I get what you mean. I get what you mean. It's interesting. That is interesting. So then, uh, yeah, it, I just, I just, I just. I don't know. It's interesting. Just I like, I like hearing what people have to like these sort of things about the album because obviously I've been listening to it with my very like. I know how everything works. I know how all the chords go and stuff. So hearing that sort of stuff is really interesting. And it contextualizes it differently for me. That's really interesting. Yeah, the the, ne the next song as well. Last night, I had a dream about mm. death. Noisy hardcore. I, I was almost hearing, you know, the band Therapy. Okay, noise rock legend. Yeah. And I also thought, is it me that I think someone like Kurt Cobain would fucking love this track? There's a real. I hope so. There's I'm a real sick. fucking beauty to it, even though it's really noisy and ugly. Mm. And there's a good breakdown riff at the end. What, what, yeah. what were you... Who wrote this? Was it a joint effort or... Was uh, this... this was a... Me... Track with all Grog lyrics. Um, so yeah, it was 50-50. I wrote all the music, Grog wrote all the lyrics of this one. This was very like... Um, once again, very every time I die. Very like big riffy sort of just hardcore metal punk track like it's it's very fucking straightforward like there's a bit of noise in the sort of breaks between the verses but it's a very straightforward song it's nothing to sort of too complicated and we sort of wanted that to we didn't want to get too caught up in a trying to be clever and trying to be oh well we'll throw this in here and we'll make that because that will really make people go oh what the fuck we're just gonna like we're just written a fucking hard like punch you so it's we write songs for energy more than anything so like we're like this is a song that we're like it's stage dive time it's like circle pit time like i know like in my brain the like the fantasy of like oh we're playing like download for example or arc tangent which we are playing um and like the we go this song to the last time i've had a dream about death you hear the count and the burn and people are like, instantly spinning that's like how i vision it like, and same with like the breakdown from it. We're like, oh, perfect. This is the like, get on the fucking stage, dive off this shit, like, moment. Like, we think about that in songs quite a lot in terms of like live energy and like live setups. Instead of just being like, oh, yeah, we're going to write a song because it sounds like we want it to have the hardest fucking bit. We just like, what songs would get us gassed if we saw them? And this is a song that would get me gassed if I saw it. I would say the same about the follow-up, track number 10, Year of the Guillotine. Oh yeah. That again, is it's just ultra heavy punk rock almost. Yeah. And I love punk rock, but no one, no one uses that term now, do they? Punk I rock think it's, it, it, punk rock comes across in a far more corny, like enemy. Yeah. Or, uh, like dad punk. Yeah, exactly. Way. Yeah, it's, it's like but punk rock, you know, like the early 80s stuff, even uh, like a lot of the hardcore stuff from America, like that band Siege, they were an influence on Napalm Death, weren't they? And, you know, when you look what inspired grunge, some really great music coming from there. But yeah, punk oh, yeah. that's great. Time, isn't it? But yeah, I, again, I, I think, based on what you're saying, track number 10 then, you, have you got the same idea in mind? It's like, let's just keep this going. You said track number nine, stage diving time. Track number 10, get us to the encore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Year of the Guillotine is a hard, is hard. That's that is the oldest song on the record, though. I we had that music that was without the lyrics and everything. Musically, that was a song we had ready for the horrible and the miserable. That didn't make it. Um, but I was like, I I love this song. I think it's really especially that verse. That verse is so like like you said, it's very punk rock. It's very just straightforward thing, but it's got all the like math core like stabs. The beginning bit is like super math and like Dillinger Escape Planning. 
Um, the breakdown is like straight up converge worship. Like, yeah. I love this song, and this song was like is incredibly like important to me. Like, it like Helen Keller teaches me how to talk to boys. Was a very like, yeah, we're queer and people like want us dead. That's bad. And this was a far more. I, I am I am taking an offensive in this stance now. Like, come up and fight me situation um and i like every night so on the tour we just did for vicarage every night where we played this song this song was like the best part of the set for me like it just the breakdown goes so hard like a lot of people seemingly really resonate with the sort of the message of the song as well like we won't be erased you can't erase us uh sort of our lifestyle, our lifestyle fucking bullshit is that the way we are. As many people want us to be erased. Um, yeah, year of the guillotine. This is the year of the guillotine. Put them all on the fucking block. That's that. See, when I was looking at the, the poster, you promote it as UK queer hardcore forever. Mm. When I did the review for Scream Blast Repeat, it didn't really come across as too dogmatic to me. And I could hear a lot of the lyrics in the songs and I, I think i said the only thing that you ram down people's throats are there's just these really heavy mm. dead guy type hardcore riffs um before we go on to four macho which is the, the concluding song should we just, can you just tell me what is what is it why is it important for hardcore to have this niche that's defined as queer hardcore or is it not important it's it is and it isn't it's not important in the sense of the micro genre, like they're not a death metal band. They're a technical Swedish black gaze band. Like in that way, this means nothing because what does queer call really mean as a genre? Like it's music created by queer people who happens to be within the hardcore sphere, if you will. But for us to sort of like I said, it's not a dogmatic album. I don't. I never want it to become a thing of being like, oh, they're the queer band. They only sing about that, and it's like becomes very like, ah, uh, not inaccessible because if, if you think our message is inaccessible, it's probably not for you, or it's probably not something I want you to be engaging with. Um, but more, we decided on this album that we were gonna start calling ourselves a queer core band, make it more of our identity, because it is part of our identity. We, we've we been saying that we're a queer hardcore band. We're a queer core band. Just combine the two, that is, that is what we are. We are queer people who write hardcore music that deals with issues relating to the queer community um, and the lives we lead and our experiences as queer people. So, we're a queer core band and that is what we want to be and we do want to expand our message and have this message of queer hardcore forever this being queer core forever queer history as my friend eddie often goes about is a very uh poorly catalogued thing a lot of the uh files and the sort of history of our sort of I keep saying people, people seem to like the wrong word, but our sort of community were destroyed in the 80s during the AIDS crisis. Like, an entire um, generation of queer people have been lost. Like, it's massively important that we as queer people have a space to write music about and space to express ourselves and it be seen as important as, say, the fucking black metal stuff is, or as important as vegan straight edge music is or whatever like it's not just uh, a marketing strategy that like we thought well we're both queer people let's call ourselves queer core and that makes us seem a bit more important it's an integral part of our identity as a band yeah it's, I, I, you were reluctant to use the word people because it does sound probably a bit people um, sounds like i'm talking about like that's very Moses, is not what I'm going for. We're a community. Yeah, yeah no, I understand. That said, I think community is a better word, isn't it? Because 
what I was going to ask you then, because clearly this is now something that you do want to promote Trinity. I never saw it as, oh, just because you're both gay, you're going to call it that. No, this is about civil rights and, like you just said, queer history and, mm. and who you are. The one thing that I would say is, occasionally it does sound like you're a separate race of people. Not race, sorry. But not even a subculture. It's really hard to define, isn't it? It's just that there's a collective. When you say we, just like I might say... There's oh, othering. Right? It's an othering. It's a what, sorry? It's an othering. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But, I mean, to me, that that's never really going to put me off the music. Because in my concluding paragraph, I said, if anything... I think this really does a lot musically to advance hardcore because a lot of people still see hardcore as it's all about the lyrics. It's all about the attitude and music comes last. And I think you're the opposite to that. And I, I knew that you'd studied music, um, B-Degree. That comes through. I, I think first and foremost, am I thinking you and Grog, as much as you, this is about who you are, first and foremost to me, the music comes first. I think this is really quite a sophisticated record from a musician mm. if i was a musician i would I, I would say this is a musician's record as much as it is social commentary or a political record i mean yeah that that's all well and good like if you like we want it to be an album you can enjoy even if you're not looking at that message like even if you just want to turn it on and hear sick fucking breakdowns or whatever like there is that but if you want to dig deeper and I mean, it's less avoidable. A lot of the lyrics are very uh, clear in what they're about. We're not sort of hiding it in metaphor and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, we, we don't want it to be. What am I trying to say? I've lost my train of thought completely. Basically, yeah, the album is for everyone. We've had a lot of people come up to like us at shows who are queer, being like, "Your music's been really important." Like. Thank you for making a space that like we we try and make our shows as inclusive and as safe as possible. Because I mean, I I, went, I remember going to hardcore shows as like a teenager, and I get the shit kicked out of me. Like, not often, not because of me being queer. Because I I don't project that. I didn't project it as much as I do now. Um, but just because it, the culture of hardcore and the culture of that was you you smash each other, like you fucking batter each other, and I like that stuff, but we've I I stopped shows on this tour being like, you are there are some very big dudes here who are just slamming into people, and there are some very small people who clearly want to get involved but do not want to get hit. Take a fucking step back. We want to make this space a available for everyone, not just the hardcore kids who want to get their fucking karate kicks in. We want it for the the like. Femmes, the thems, the queer people, the people of colour, people who do not feel often comfortable or safe or welcome at those shows. You want them to be and have a space where at a death metal show, anyone can come and grab the mic. Anyone can have their first time like stage diving here. Like we, that's an integral part of that and this album is an integral part of that. Yeah, no, completely agree with that. So let, let's come to the, the last song then. Number 11, Four Macho. Obviously, the title tells you what I suggest you should know what it's about. Um, can, before we talk about the music on this, mm. is there an angle to this lyrically that is almost like self remonstration that you're pretending to be macho and you know that you don't really want to be this person? You yeah, have? 100%. The, right. the sort of lyrics. The lyrics in this one are very difficult. We basically use it as a bit of an exercise of seeing if we can write lyrics that still have meaning but aren't quite so like, I am sad and this is happening and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, hence the very colourful imagery. The I was using a lot of like, um, like fetish imagery and like I was really into that at the time. Like I was following a lot of like um, queer like uh bdsm groups and sort of like reading into the history of that and how where that's sort of the culture sort of mix it's really interesting like history um but yeah foam match is this idea of being like you could be in a club trying to be as hard as you want but often or not it could be a uh, guys or something else or it's just a weird party song it's just a weird dance party 
with, loads of people have been bringing up Blood Brothers for it, which I didn't quite clock until it was just like, oh, it's very Blood Brothers y, which is cool because I love Blood Brothers. Um, yeah, it's a weird little song, but I fucking love so much. I'm, I'm, that was another song where we wrote it and I was like, cool, I don't know how people are going to respond to this. And that's why we wanted it to be the first single as well. Like, we don't want to leave with a song. Was the, um, sorry, I think we've lost you there. Whatever. Oh, no, you're, sorry, there's a bit of a, a glitch there. Um, yeah, music there, this is definitely stands out, doesn't it? It starts with like this happy clappy. Yeah. Like, well, it's almost like a, a 1950s American teen song. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I, want, I wanted to, I wanted to have a 1950s, like, Beach Boys cat sort of thing. And then I was like, well, why don't we make this a snap? As I'm mean, gonna make it like a cheerleader, like chant <laughs> thing, and then we put that all over like a Mets, Giller Band, noisy, like guitar and drums, like thing. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a fucking really weird song, but I love it. And like, once again, a song that goes down, I'm live, yeah, not <laughs> going on. It's almost, like catch on to the lyrics, so we like at the. It, it's almost got a mis- and mis- we wanted it to be this chant, so like. Sorry. Uh, sorry, it keeps cutting out for some reason at this point. I was gonna say it's almost got like a Mr. Bungle type vibe to it as well. I don't know if you ever listened to. My oh movie. yeah. Definitely heard. Yeah, I, I love Mr. Bungle. It was just so when I heard it, I was like, it, it sounded so misanthropic though, even though it had this. Hmm. It's, 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 it's mischievous. Yeah. It's like it's devilish cheerleaders, like having a dance at the end of the film, sort of thing. Like it's like as the school burns at like the prom. Like it's wild. It's a really weird song, but I I adore Very Macho so much, and it being like a real experiment in like what can we get away with? Because like we can get away with doing a lot of stuff within the like hardcore realm but the sort of heavier realm with death girls like the album is quite eclectic there's not one particular vibe i think it all sounds very death goalsy but like it's not one sort of thing like ah oh, they're a real like terror not loose like hardcore band or whatever um but fire match is a real like spanner in the works um and we like that we like ending on like like how we ended on nothing left to give with that which was like this big anthemic emo song at the end of the first album ending on this big like chaotic like nightmare party song just felt right um and it keeps the door open for whatever we write next it's such a weird way to end a record that we could just go we'll just follow on from that we'll just follow on on just like a noise dance record or we could just write like whatever like keeping the possibilities open is very much an uh, important thing for us. Yeah, a clever way to end it, I agree. You positioned yourself or pivoted the next time to do what the fuck you want, really. Yeah, exactly. You've earned, you've earned that right, and people won't be worried about that, will they? I think you are. Yeah, no. you are, You've already laid out that path, and you love your breakdowns, so they'll probably still appear. Oh, yeah. You're There'll really always be breakdowns on a Death Girls of Record. That is a guarantee. There'll always be gnarly breakdowns. Excellent. Well, We've come to the end of the interview. We've gone through the album. Um, I think I'll probably be seeing you. Are you playing uh, Lech with Garden City, is it? On the 17th? We're pla- yeah, we're playing an in-store in uh, the record shop store. That was my first ever job. Dave's, is it? David's, yeah. David's. Um, I'm well excited. I don't think they quite realise what they've got themselves into. I was think- thinking that. I was like, hmm, this is really extreme music. I've, I've, I've um. I've been speaking to a lot of my mates about it and they're like, so you're doing like an acoustic set, right? I was like, no, 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 no. We are full, full guns blazing, decimating that shop. It's going to be, it's going to be fucking righteous. Free show, isn't it, as well? Yeah, 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 free. Free show, always. Well, I'll I'll be seeing you there. I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll cover it for ADK. I I might, I might review it for Scream Life for as well. That'll be sick. (laughs) It will be for me. In a bookstore. I've been there. I've bought a few things in there in the past. So yeah, that that what a great idea to have. A yeah, honestly. Shout out to Paul from Talagators. He asked us to do it, and like 
my old, 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 old band did an install there years ago, and we were like a Coheed and Cambria esque, like alt rock band or whatever. And we, they were like, oh yeah, that was pretty heavy. Like in bits, while I did some screaming, I was like, we're gonna get shut down. The aim is that we're gonna get shut down two songs in. I think there's a good chance. <laughs> That's my sort of like, if we don't get shut down, I'm wicked. If we do, we. I've won. I'm then the coolest person in half shit. Win-win situation. <laughs> I see. Smash Excellent. it up. It'll be great. Well, thanks very much for joining me tonight. No worries. Uh, thanks for having me, Kirk. Absolute pleasure. I wanted to interview you for the uh, the last album. and never got round to it. So when this one came out, straight away, I was like, as soon as I heard track number one, it's like, I'm interviewing Harry. Oh, oh yeah, sick. Well, so, yep, yeah, I'll see you at that show and I'm no doubt hopefully see you at some of the other... Uh, shows in the London and Hartwich area. Okay. Thank you.